Welcome. My name is Russell Corvo, or welcome to another OS Avlo Academy webinar. Today's webinar is going to be basic electrical concepts for architectural hardware. My name is Russell Corvo, and I'm the training and development manager. I've been with Sargent and OS Avlo since 1986. This session should last about 45 minutes. During this session, your lines will be muted. However, you can pose questions as we go along using the question and answer icon at the bottom of the page. Also within 24 hours, you will receive an email from Asa Ablo Academy as your proof of attendance that can be submitted to your employer or one of the industry association partners such as DHI or LOA for industry CEUs in lieu of a certificate of completion for these short trainings. In addition, Asa Ablo Academy has over 50 online courses, all available at no cost. To get started, just simply join the Academy and start learning at your own pace. Thank you very much for coming to today's webinar. I hope you find this interesting. I find electricity extremely interesting. So let's get started. Okay, what is electricity? The concept of electricity is fairly difficult to grasp because we really can't see electricity except in the form of lightning and static electricity. And when we feel electricity, it's usually unintentional because it hurts and it can be very dangerous. Electricity is simply the movement of electrons. As I hope you realize, everything around you is made up of atoms. Atoms are made up of protons, which are positive, and neutrons, which are neutral, at the center of the atoms. And the electrons, which are the negative portion of the atom, travel in various orbits around the center of the atom. When electrons are forced to move from one atom to another atom, this movement is what produces electricity. The larger the atom, the more electrons in its orbits. Atoms such as copper, gold, silver, aluminum have incomplete outer shells. And because the outer shell is incomplete, the atom has very little holding power to retain the electrons, allowing the electrons to move freely between atoms. Voltage is what pushes the electrons between the atoms. If you attached a wire to the two ends of a battery, it allows the electrons to flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, creating a circuit. The very name circuit implies a circular structure or a closed circuit. If a load such as a lamp was placed in series with the wire, the lamp would glow due to the electrons traveling through the filament of the light. The components that make up a simple circuit are as follows. You have a switch, which can either be a smart switch or a common switch. A smart switch requires electricity to operate, while a common switch does not. Next, we have the load. The load itself is why the circuit was created. The intention is to get the current to the load and the load can be anything that requires electricity, such as a mag lock, a card reader, a PIR, a timer, or even a lamp. All of those are considered a load because they require electricity to operate. Next, we have the conductor, which carries the current from the power source to the load and then back to the power source. And the last item we have is the power source, and this is going to be measured in amps and volts. Voltage is what pushes the electrons within a wire, similar how a water pump pushes water within a pipe. Just as the flow of electrons, just, just as current flows through, just as current flows in a wire, the size of a pipe affects how much water can flow down a pipe, just as the size of a water, just as the size of a wire will determine how many electrons can actually flow down that wire. So the size of the wire does make a big difference. The filament within a light bulb opposes the flow of electrons. A certain voltage or amperage are required to push the electrons through the filament of the light bulb. If the voltage or the amperage is insufficient, the filament will prevent the flow of electrons and the light will not produce any light. What also needs to be considered is the wire run. Even though wire is a great conductor of electrons, it still poses some resistance to the flow of electrons and therefore must be taken into consideration. Just as a 12 volt solenoid will burn out if attached to a 36 volt power supply, a load such as a light bulb, an electric motor, a keypad, 
requires a specific voltage or a, or a particular voltage range. If the voltage is too great, the load will burn out and no longer function. One way to avoid this is with a fuse. A fuse is designed to cut the current, is, is designed to cut the current prior to it affecting the load. Okay. okay. So one way of avoiding this is with a fuse. A fuse is designed to cut the current within a circuit prior to the causing any damage to the load. Voltage is what pushes the free electrons within a circuit and, move, and moves the electrons and causes the lamp to glow. Without voltage, electrons within a wire will move freely in any direction because there's nothing pushing them. So they'll just move freely and the lamp will no longer glow. You have, you can have, just so you know, you can have voltage without any amperage. And a good example of this would be a battery because a battery, when it's not hooked up to a circuit, has voltage, but there is no current flow. So therefore there's no flow of current. So you can have voltage without current flow. The force of the voltage is the potential energy that is, that is only released when the circuit is created and then the voltage pushes the electrons through the circuit. Since a nine volt battery provides more pushing force than a one and a half volt AA battery, the lamp would, grow, would glow brighter. A battery with voltage is not at a state of equilibrium because the battery because of the voltage inside of the battery causes pressure and causes an imbalance. And only when the voltage is completely drained and the battery is completely dead, will it be at a state of equilibrium. Simply put, the voltage in the battery is always looking to drain, from the, drain the electrons from the negative side of the battery to the positive side. This is accomplished by creating a circuit. So the electrons can travel from the negative side to the positive side and materials that do not contain many free electrons are called insulators. A circuit uses wire to conduct as a conductor to move electrons within a circuit and offers very little comparison or resistance. The thickness of the wire is called the gauge. The smaller the wire, the smaller the gauge number, the larger the wire. Copper and aluminum are Copper and aluminum are the most common materials used for conductors. Gold is, gold is used where corrosion resistance is required. And generally, stranded wire is used on low voltage systems using 12 or 24 volt power supplies, as we do in the architectural hardware industry. Electricity always flows on the outer surface of wires, and that's why stranded wire provides much, stranded wire provides a much more surface area and allows the greater flow of electrons. Most wires are surrounded by an insulator. An insulator has very few electrons, so therefore it opposes the flow of electrons or opposes the flow of the current. An insulator prevents the flow of electrons outside of the wire. The insulating material most frequently used is a thermoplastic because thermoplastics will burn, but they will not melt when they heat up. Um, rubber and most plastics are also very good insulators. Okay. The rate at which electrons flow through a circuit are measured in amps. One amp is one coulomb. One coulomb is about six quadrillion, 242 quadrillion electrons per second. Just as the rate of just as the rate of water flow is measured in gallons per second, current is measured in coulombs per second and is displayed as amps. Current is the continuous and uniform flow of electrons within a circuit and is measured in amps or amperes. Ohms is the measured value of resistance to the flow or the movement of electrons within a circuit. Adding resistors or changing the wire size changes the rate at which the electrons flow through a circuit. Resistance is measured in ohms. Only so many electrons can pass through a wire at one time. The smaller the wire, the smaller the diameter, the fewer the number of electrons that are allowed to flow through the wire 
And if too many electrons are being forced through the circuit, the circuit will initially heat up and then something's gonna to have to give. Either the product is gonna to have to fail or hopefully there may be a fuse or a breaker within the circuit. Okay, let's talk about fuses for a few moments. So, so if the voltage in the current is too great, something is gonna to have to fail and this is why fuses were developed. This is the basic concept of a fuse. These are 12 volt fuses that are used in cars. Notice the wire and its diameter. The wire diameter is different, different between the two because they are each rated to handle a different number of amps at 12 volts. The red one, the red one can handle 10 amps. The red one can handle 10 amps while the blue one can handle 15 amps. And that's why the wire diameter is larger in the 15 amp than it is in the 10 amp fuse. So to be clear, if the current run, if the current running through the 10 amp fuse is greater than 10 amps at 12 volts, the fuse will break, cutting the power and to protect the electronic device that it's designed to power, such as the car radio, windshield wipers, and so forth. Okay, let's take a look at how this can happen. Okay, so we're going to examine this further. A breaker box or a fuse box contains circuit breakers, okay? The circuit breakers are rated for a certain number of amps at 110 volts. So this would be like a circuit you have in your house and it has, and each, each circuit breaker has a certain ramp, amp rating at 110 volts. Within the circuit, if the amperage exceeds the rated, the rated amperage value of the circuit breaker, the circuit will pop causing the load to be cut or causing the current to be cut to the load. And a circuit breaker is just one type of fuse. So here we have a household wall outlet supplying 100, capable of supplying 110 volts. The breaker box in the basement has a 10 amp breaker on this wall switch, okay? So this is our setup right now. So if we plug a 100 watt light bulb into this 110 volt plug, the 100 watt light bulb will require Excuse me. The 100 watt light bulb will require 0.9 amps of current at 110 volts. Okay, so it's going to be it's going to require 0.9 amps of current. Let's say we let's say we plug 15 100 watt light bulbs into this one outlet. The 15 light bulbs will each require 0.9 amps. 15 times 0.9 is 13.5 amps of current. Remember, there's a 10 amp breaker in the circuit. With the 15 light bulbs, the circuit is demanding 13.58 or 13.5 amps. And since the circuit contains a 10 amp circuit breaker, the circuit breaker will pop, opening up the circuit and cutting the electricity to the wall outlet. The circuit with the 10 amp fuse or the breaker can handle 100 amps at a excuse me, can only handle 10 amps at 110 volts. So the amperage was too great and that's why the fuse popped, cutting the current to the load. A very good analogy would be that the fuse or the breaker is the weak link in a circuit. Another means of controlling and restricting the amount of current flowing through a circuit is with resistors. There are quite a few different types of resistors. The most common types of resistors is a simple resistor or a uh, pedometer, which is a variable resistor. Potentiometer. Thank you. A resistor is rated in ohms. Resistance is the resist, a resistor is used to reduce the current flow and adjust the signal lever and adjust the signal lever along with many other uses. Most commonly used is to control the current within a circuit and must be tested in series. A variable resistor allows the resist allows resistance to be set with the dial. Okay, we're going to go over some different types of items used in electronics. The first one we went over was for resistors. The next one is an MOV. An MOV is a metal oxidized resistor. All electronic devices having a coil, such as electromagnets, relays, strikes, can produce electronic kickback when de-energized. The, the kickback can cause damage to the switch. Placing an MOV across the power 
across the power and negative lines of the device within a, right next to the coil will, excuse me, by attaching an MOV across the power lines between the negative and positive lines of the device, the coil, such as an electromagnet, this will prevent the kickback. Let's look at this further. An MOV are, are installed across the power lines of the lock. The MOV functions to absorb the induction kickback by the lock's coil. Without an MOV, the, kick, the kickback voltage can arc across the arc, can, can arc across the contacts. The arc can also cause electronic noise and can also cause the uh, microprocessor to malfunction. The MOV should always be spliced into the lock's power as close to the lock as possible. Some DC electronic locks have uh, internal kickback protection. And just so you know, all Securitron mag locks have the MOV automatically built in, so you never have to worry about it with Securitron mag locks. The next item we're looking at is a capacitor. A capacitor is used to create clean power for sensitive equipment, such as touch bars and card readers. A capacitor stores, stores electricity and then releases it in a more controlled manner. Okay, that's what a capacitor does. Capacitors are also used in different products such as flash units. So because a capacitor can release the electricity very quickly, it allows the flash unit to create a very bright light of flash. The amount of time can be controlled or increased on how fast the capacitor releases the electricity. One thing to be aware of, capacitors store electricity for some time and can be, some, and can be dangerous. If you're ever dealing with an old circuit board, Capacitors are, can actually be quite dangerous because it's the only thing on the circuit board that can store up electricity and retain it for over long periods of time. So if you complete the contact of a capacitor, you could, you could create a nice shock for yourself is what I'm saying. Okay, looking at most, most of our laptops require DC current and the adapter will have a label stating its input and output. The input range is 110, 110 to 240 volts at approximately 2.5 amps at 50 or 60 megahertz. When it comes to megahertz, Europe uses 50 megahertz, which is 50 cycles per second, while the United States uses 60 megahertz, which is 60 cycles per second. So what they're telling you is that this adapter can work in both the United States and Europe with any voltage range from 100 to 240 volts on either megahertz, either 50 or 60 megahertz. And the output for this, which is what's required by the computer, is 19.5 volts DC at 6.7 amps. So it's very precise. The first and simpler type of electricity is called direct current and is abbreviated DC. DC current is created by using batteries, commutators, solar panels, and other means. With DC current, the electricity flows in one direction from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. The other type of electricity you're familiar with is alternating current, and that's abbreviated as AC. With alternating current, the electricity goes in one direction, then goes in the other direction. In the United States, this occurs at 60, sec at 60 times per second. Each current type has its own advantages and disadvantages, and we'll touch on those shortly. This is a name you should know. Nikola Tesla is given credit for discovering AC current. Tesla discovered that moving a magnet back and forth within, back and forth within a coil of wire causes the electrons to move within the coil. So as the magnet's moving back and forth, it just causes the, the electrons within the coil to move back and forth. This can also be accomplished by rotating a copper coil within a magnetic field. And that's the second, that's the view on the right. The magnetic field will cause the electrons within the coil to move back and forth, once again, creating an electrical current. The movement of the electrons is the alternating current. As the electrons move through the filament, the light bulb, 
as the electrons move through the filament of the light bulb, the filament resists the movement of these electrons and the electrons are forced to move through the filament. And the filament will starts to heat up and will start to glow to produce light. One unique thing with DC current with AC current is that the electrons are not used up as they are with DC current. Since the electrons are shuffling back and forth, you're using the same electrons all the time. They're just being shoved back and forth. So it's the movement of the electrons within the circuit that actually create the power, not the electrons themselves. Okay. Alternating current is the electricity supplied to our house in our household wall outlets. It is used to power most of our electrical appliances. The direction of the current shuffles back and forth or reverses at 60 times per second in the United States and 50 times per second in Europe. How is DC current created? Battery creates DC current through a chemical reaction. DC current can also be created with a commutator. A commutator has split rings and allows it to produce DC current. This video is going to explain how a DC motor. This video is going to explain how a DC motor works. Keep in mind that a DC motor uses electricity to create rotational motion. But if you apply rotational motion to the DC motor, it will create DC current. Let's take a look at the video. Take a look at the video before we switch. DC motor possible. It looks like this. The stator provides a constant magnetic field and the armature, which is the rotating part, is a simple coil. The armature is connected to a DC power source through a pair of commutator rings. When the current flows through the coil, an electromagnetic force is induced on it according to the Lorentz law, so the coil will start to rotate. You will notice that as the coil rotates, the commutator rings connect with the power source of opposite polarity. As a result, on the left side of the coil, the electricity will always flow away, and on the right side, electricity will always flow towards. This ensures that the torque action is also in the same direction throughout the motion, so the coil will continue rotating. With a single armature, the DC output will go on and off at 60 times per second. By increasing the number of splits in the commutator ring, the commutator will produce a more consistent current with far less noise. Here's a good, here's a good look showing you the differences between how DC current is generated opposed to AC current. We just saw how DC current is produced using a commutator with the split rings, allowing electricity to flow in only one direction. AC current is produced using a generator. The basic difference, the basic difference between is that a commutator has split rings while a generator has two separate rings in contact with opposite ends of the coil, as you can see here. So the, the commutator has the split rings. And at this one here, um, the generator is connected to both ends of the coil, the copper coil. You'll notice in the upper image that the meter only moves in one direction because of the split coil producing DC current. The lower image demonstrates the basic concept of an AC generator. The meter moves in both directions because the generator is producing AC current. Since two separate rings are always in contact with opposite ends of the coils, rotating the coil within the magnetic field will cause the electrons to move back and forth, creating AC current. At this point, you're probably asking yourself, why do we use AC current in our house as opposed to DC current? Considering that so many items in your house require DC current, such as uh, computers, that you plug them into AC, you plug them into your house, but all of them have adapters to convert it to DC current. And you have that with your computers, your TVs, and most of your electronic equipment. Next, I'm going to show you a video that explains the one feature that makes AC current so dominant and why we use AC current opposed to DC current traveling throughout the country.
and it's going to explain how our transistor works, or a transformer works. Let's take a look. As the current flows through the cable, it will emit a magnetic field. If we pass DC current through the cable, the magnetic field will remain constant. But if we pass AC current through the cable, then the magnetic field will increase and decrease in strength and changes polarity as the current changes direction. If we place multiple cables together and pass current through them, then the magnetic fields will combine to create a stronger magnetic field. If we then wrap the cable into a coil, the magnetic field will become even stronger. If we then place a second coil in close proximity to the first coil and then we pass AC alternating current through the first coil, then the magnetic field it creates will induce a current into the second coil and this magnetic force will push and pull on the free electrons, forcing them to move. The key component here is that the magnetic field is changing polarity as well as intensity. This change in intensity and direction of the magnetic field constantly disturbs the free electrons in the secondary coil and this forces them to move. This movement is known as electromotive force or EMF. Electromotive force does not occur when we pass DC current through the primary coil and that's because the magnetic field is constant so the electrons are not being forced to move. As the current Hopefully that made sense. So the electromotive forces is what makes the transformer possible. Here's a very simple look at how a transformer works. If both coils of a transformer have the same number, same number of coils, the created current will have the same voltage in the current as the original coil. If you double the number of coils on the receiving end, the voltage will double and the amperage will be cut in half. If you double the number of coils once again, once again, the voltage will double and the amperage will be cut in half. The properties of electricity allow the voltage and the amperage to be manipulated. When it's time to reduce the voltage, the number of coils on the receiving end will be half, of the, half the number of coils of the producing end, therefore cutting the voltage in half and doubling the number of amps. This cannot be done with DC current and and that's exactly why Tesla's AC current became the standard. Taking a look at the correlation between amps and voltage, because of the properties of alternating current and a power station can produce 500 amps at 14,080 volts of volts, which is equivalent to 64,000 amps at 110 volts. Thinking about this further, Thinking about this further, it's much easier to deliver 500 across the country than it would be to deliver 64,000 amps across the country. Keep in mind, a wire can only handle so many amps, and therefore you need the wire to be large enough to handle 64,000 amps. But when you increase the voltage, then the wire only has to be able to handle 500 amps, so it's much, much lower. And that's the great thing about AC current and transformers. Considering that, current, considering that current is the flow of electrons and voltage is the pressure that pushes the electrons within a circuit, voltage times current required by a product is called watts. An incandescent light bulb rated at 100 watts requires 0.9 amps of household current. 100 watts divided by, 100 watts divided by 110 volts equals 0.9 amps. If you were able to operate that 100 watt light bulb at 220 volts, then you would only re you would require less amps. So if that same light bulb operated at 220 volts, you would only require 0.45 amps. If you were able to run the 100 watt light bulb at 440 volts, you would only need 0.25 amps. If you were able to run it at 800 or 880 volts, you could get 0.1125 amps. So you can see the correlation between the two. And lastly, 100 watt light bulb operating at 1760 volts would only require 0 0.04625 amps. So the greater the voltage, that's the less amperage required to, create, to accomplish the same amount of work is what we're saying, okay? So the, the greater the voltage, the less amps required to accomplish the same amount of work. Equipment that uses a constant and steady flow of electrons requires DC current. AC current is used with products that are not affected by the fluctuation in the current. 
both AC current and DC current are fairly easy to create. The problem is AC current cannot be stored or accumulated and electric the electricity must be, with AC current, the electricity must be used up as it's created. And with DC current, it can be stored in, store, stored in the form of batteries, but batteries are very expensive and very, very little storage capacity. Okay, in architectural hardware industry, most electrified products are either going to be 12 or 24 volts DC. All DC power supplies are going to be rated in volts and apt capacity. All components within a circuit, and this is very, very important, all the components within a circuit must operate the same voltage or the same voltage range. Okay, that's extremely important. When given a choice between 12 and 24 volts, always select 24 volts. 24 volts requires less current draw, therefore you can use smaller wires. 24 volt power supply will also require a lower amp capacity. A diode, a diode is, a, is, an is an electronic device that allows current to flow only in one direction, but not back in the other direction. So that's what a diode does. And probably most of you have heard of a light emitting diode. A light emitting diode is a diode that produces light, simply that produces light. And used commonly to indicate status on whether a door is locked or unlocked. Next is gonna be a short little video explained to how an LED works opposed to an incandescent light. A much more efficient source of light is a light emitting diode or LED. LEDs basically contain two specialized semiconductors that are stuck together. And when you apply a large enough voltage across them, they emit light from a process called electroluminescence. There is some heat produced, but overall the process is a lot more efficient and you can get a lot of light from a very small device. On average, they last for over 10 years of continuous usage, so you can see why they're popular. Light bulbs like this work by passing large amounts of current through a thin filament, which is basically a wire. The filament gets so hot that it starts glowing and emitting light, and this process is very inefficient. Less than 5% of the energy going into the bulb gets turned into light, and the rest gets turned into heat. Okay, so that explains the difference between how an LED produces light opposed to an incandescent light bulb. Next question is, how is AC current converted into DC current? One way of doing this is with a diode as a bridge rectifier. Taking a look at the image on the right is a bridge rectifier. The two yellow wires is where the AC, where the AC current is placed, and the red and the black wire are the positive and negative DC current coming out of it, so it converts AC current to DC current. And both of those devices on the right-hand side are bridge rectifiers. Taking a look at how AC current can, is converted to DC current, here you have an AC power, all right? The green line is for the negative. You'll notice that they keep alternating back and forth because it's AC current. So this AC power supply is putting out positive negative. It keeps shuffling back and forth. We're just going to complete this view now. Here are the four diodes converting AC current to DC current. This is happening very quickly and it can be sort of hard, but I just wanted to show you. You're using the four diodes here to constantly produce a constant output of DC current where one wire is always positive and the other one is always negative. And since the diodes only allow the electricity to flow in one direction with using four diodes, you can turn AC current into DC current. In this industry, there are usually two types of power supplies. There are switching power supplies and linear power supplies. Here's a brief explanation on how each works. And here's a brief explanation on how each works. Today, I'm going to discuss the two major types of DC power supply and the pros and cons of each. There are two main designs for DC power supplies, linear DC power supplies and switching DC power supplies. To represent each type, I have the PWR01 switching power supply and the PMXA linear DC power supply. Although both of these instruments are designed to supply DC power to electrical and electronic circuits, the way in which the power is provided is completely different. Linear power supplies, like the PMXA, 
utilize a transformer to drop voltage from the AC line to a much lower AC voltage, then use a series of rectifier circuitry and filtering processes to produce a very clean DC voltage. On the other hand, switching DC power supplies regulate output voltage through a process known as pulse width modulation. This process generates some high frequency noise but enables the power supply to be highly power efficient with a small form factor. In addition to increased reliability, a linear power supply is virtually immune to noise and electromagnetic interference, making it perfect for sensitive DUTs like medical equipment and low noise amplifiers. Linear power supplies also have vastly superior transient response, meaning that much less time is required for the output voltage to recover from changes in the load. Okay, that was a brief, brief description of each. Hopefully that made a little bit sense to you. The switching power supply is going to be smaller and usually less expensive than the linear power supplies. Okay. Even though wire is a good conductor of electricity, it still resists the flow of, elect of electricity. The resistance to the flow, the resistance do the resistance reduces the voltage. The resistance can be calculated and is calculated in ohms. This chart shows the resistance for 100 for 1,000 feet of copper cable. When calculating the distance for DC current, the distance must be measured from the power supply to the load and then back to the power supply. Because keep in mind, it has to complete a complete circuit. So the, the wire has to go to the power, to the load and back. So it's a complete circuit. You have to double the length, the distance. 24 volt DC will allow longer wire runs with thinner wires. This is a concern because wire is expensive. Okay. Within a circuit, anything that requires electricity is considered a load. A load a load requires a particular voltage or a particular voltage range with a minimum number of amps to function. Within a circuit, the amp requirements for each load of the circuit must be added up to make sure you have a sufficient number of amps to operate all the loads op operating at once. It is recommended that you supply 25% more than the required, the requ 25% more amps than the required by all the loads within the circuit. So it always gets 25% more Current. All devices within a circuit that open or closed are considered switches. Common or dumb switches are operated by touch, such as push button or key switches. Dumb switches, a dumb switch does not require any electricity to operate. Here are a few different dumb switches. First, we have a standard door position switch, followed by a toggle switch, and then there's a couple light switches and a few push button switches. A smart switch is a switch that requires power to operate and is also a load within the circuit. Devices such as keypads, timers, card readers, push button, lighted push buttons, motion sensors, and, and touch sense bars are smart switches. These switches draw current to operate. These switches may also consume power when activated. All these requirements must be taken into consideration when determining the total amperage required for once for a complete circuit. Okay, so you have to consider everything. And sometimes, sometimes a smart switch is what we're saying is that it will have a very low current draw while it's in the standby mode, but when it's activated, it actually requires more current to activate it. So you need to make sure you take that into consideration also. Now we're going to take a moment and talk about locking devices. Basically, there are two types of electronic locking devices. This fail safe and these fail secure locking devices. The difference between, the difference being that a fail safe lock requires electricity to lock the door, while a fail secure lock requires electricity to unlock the door. Fail safe and fail secure are spec specifies the door status. The term normally open and normally closed are often, are some, the terms normally open and normally closed is referred to are, you're referring to switches, but oftentimes are very confusing to a lot of people. So we'll touch on that in a moment. Electronics, uh, electronic strikes, mortise locks, cylindrical locks, exit devices are all available as fail safe or fail secure. Most often, fail secure locks is what's used because you need to supply power to unlock them so they remain locked at all times. Fail secure locks normally will 
fail secure locks require a normally open switch. Okay. Fail safe locks, such as mag locks or fail safe strikes, require power to keep them locked. When the power is interrupted, the lock, when power is interrupted to the lock, the door becomes unlocked. Fail safe locks are most often used in the means of egress, automatically unlocking when the fire alarm is activated, cutting electricity to the mag locks and allowing people to exit the building freely. Fail safe locks are required normally. Fail safe locks require normally closed switches. And now we're going to get into that. When you're working with switches, you'll be working with normally open or normally closed switches. You need, sorry, you need to think of the switches as drawbridges and the electrons or the electricity as the cars. When the drawbridge is open, no cars are allowed to pass. This is the exact same concept when it comes to switches. When the circuit is open, the circuit is broken, cutting the power to the load and the load will no longer function. A normally open switch means that the circuit is normally open and the current is not allowed to flow through the circuit in its normal state. A normally open switch are used with fail secure locks. With fail secure locks, electricity is applied to the lock to unlock it. A normally open switch with a fail secure lock, the door would remain secure until the, until the switch contact is closed, completing the circuit and unlocking the door. Okay, so there we are, it's normally open. And once it closes, it completes the circuit and would unlock the door. When multiple switches are required to unlock the same fail secure lock, the normally open switches are gonna be wired in parallel as shown here, okay? The switches are wired in parallel, so activating any of the switches will unlock the door. So if we hit the bottom switch, the current will be completed through the bottom switch. If we hit the middle switch, the current is gonna be completed through the middle switch. And if we hit the top switch, once again, the current will be completed through the top switch, unlocking the door. Okay. A normally closed contact means that the circuit is, is closed and the current is allowed to flow through the circuit in its normal state. A normally closed switches are used for fail safe locks. With fail safe locks, the locks always require power to keep them secure. With fail safe locks, the current needs to be cut to the lock to unlock the door. Okay. When multiple switches are required to unlock one fail safe lock, the normally closed switches are gonna be wired in series as shown here. Activation of any of the switches will open the circuit, cutting the electricity to the lock and unlocking the door. Okay, so activating any of those switches. A few more terms, and this is running a little long, I apologize. Uh, the correct terminology when it comes to switches is quite simple. A pole or a common is the input for a switch. Power always goes into the pole or the, the common. The output, the output on the switches are known as throws. So normally our outputs are known as throws. The throws can be either normally open or normally closed. Switches can be purchased in multiple poles and multiple throws. One of the most common switches is a single pole double throw switch. One of the throws is normally open and the other throw would normally be closed. In addition to switches being normally open and normally closed, switches are come as either momentary, momentary or maintained switches. A momentary switch is a switch that changes from normally open to normally closed or normally closed to normally open when acted, when acted upon, such as a doorbell is a momentary switch, okay? A second type of switch would be a maintained switch, which is also known as an alternate action switch. These switches, these switches change state. They're either gonna be open or closed, and once they're acted upon, they change from open or closed, and they do not change until they're acted on again. A very familiar maintained switch would be a light switch, okay? A single AA battery has a potential voltage of one and a half volts and is measured and is measured parallel and is one type of power supply. A conductor such as a wire is placed between the negative and the positive. The conductor will allow the current to flow, flow in the battery 
will allow the current to flow from the negative side to the positive side of the battery and discharge the battery. When a load such as a lamp, a motor, a card reader, a cylinder, or any device requires electricity is placed in series with the conductor, the current will power the load and if the voltage and amperage is, if the amperage and the voltage is sufficient. Keep in mind, this is important. If two batteries are hooked up in series, the voltage is added together. So you have now a total of three volts, okay? Now you have a total of three volts. The more voltage, the more pressure, the more pressure, the more force make, they will make the light brighter because it's pushing more electrons through it because the voltage is greater. Batteries that are hooked up in parallel, the voltage remains the same. The lamp's output will remain consistent for a single battery or batteries wired in parallel, but will remain powered for longer. So this does not change the voltage when they're wired up in parallel. Measuring voltage. So we're gonna look at how to measure voltage. Voltage is the pressure pushing the electrons through the wire and voltage is measured, is measured in parallel. Okay. When loads, when loads are wired in series to the voltage, the voltage is split. Okay. So here we have a single light. No matter where we me measure the voltage, it's going to measure one and a half volts. Whether we measure it at the battery or we measure it at the light, it's still going to measure one and a half volts. When, when you have two loads wired in series, so you have two light bulbs here wired in series, the voltage is now split. As you can see, the total voltage measured over the battery is going to be one and a half volts. But when you measure one light at a time, one lamp at a time, the voltage is split. So each one will only show 0.75 volts. Okay. So either lamp, since the lamps are the same size, they're going to use the same amount of current. So we split the voltage. Measuring, now we're going to talk about measuring amps. Okay, and I do have Ohm's law up here, which is, okay, this is Ohm's law, which is current times voltage over resistance. Okay, amperage is the flow of current through a wire. To measure current, to measure current with a multimeter, the current must be measured in series so that the current flows through the meter. In this example, one and a half volts through a one ohm lamp uses one and a half amps of current which is equal to 96 quadrillion, 636 quadrillion electrons flowing through the lamp every second. If one of the two ohm lamps were placed, if two one ohm lamps were placed in series within the circuit, the resistance doubles due to the two lamps restricting the number of electrons allowed to flow through the circuit. In this, ex in this example, sorry, in, in this example, the current flow is only going to be 0.75 amps. Keep in mind that the ohms is the resistance. And since you just double the resistance, as we had here, we had one and a half volts. And since we have two ohms opposed to just one ohm, it divided. So one and a half divided by two is going to give you the 0.75 amps. Okay. Continuing on, since current is the flow of electricity and the flow must remain constant no matter where it's measured. And, and it's going to remain constant no matter where it's measured. So whether you measure it in between the lights or be, before and after light, it does remain consistent. This is the same slide I showed you a few back. I just wanted to remind you that one and a half volts passing through a one ohm lamp will allow only one and a half amps of current to pass through the circuit per second. And the reason I'm doing this is this example here. If you have two lamps wired in parallel, it creates two paths allowing twice as many amps to flow through the circuit. The current flow is a total of three amps here, okay? So we're now, we're letting twice as many amps through because we've given them two paths. So here you have, you have the current, you have the voltage divided by the ohms. So you have one and a half ohms divided by one, and one and a half ohms divided by one, and anything divided by one is going to be the number itself. So one and a half plus one and a half is a total of three amps. Okay, continuing on. 
When the current is measured through only one of the lamps, the one ohm lamp will only allow so many amps through, will only allow so many amps through the light. The one and a half volts passing through the one ohm amp will only allow point one and a half amps of current to flow through the light at per second. Okay. Continuing on, stick with me for this. We're almost through this. When measuring current through the second one ohm lamp, the current remains the same since both lamps are one ohm lamps. Okay, so only when we measure at the very beginning before it separates, it's going to be three amps. But when we measure on each of the individual lights, it's only going to be one and a half amps. And once again, because we've given two paths, we're adding the two paths together. So one and a half volts plus one and a half volts is going to give us the three amps. Continuing on, if we increase, if we if we increase the resistance of one of the lamps by three times with a three ohm lamp, the one ohm lamp is allowing one and a half amps as it did previously, but the three ohm lamp offers three times the resistance, allowing only one third as many amps through the circuit. And one and a half amps times one third is only half an amp. So the total number of amps the total number of amps will be read as the two readings combined for a total of two amps, okay? Because it's more resistance, the less amps can get through. Another example, if we replace the two ohm lamp, if we replace the three ohm lamp with the two ohm lamp, the one ohm lamp, once again, will allow one and a half amps of current as it did previously. The two ohm lamp offers twice the resistance, so it will only allow half as many amps well, only half as many amps for a total of 0.75 amps. The total amps will be the two readings combined once again. So the total amp reading on this is gonna be 2.5 amps. Hopefully this makes sense to you. This is the last slide right here. Okay, so here's a true to life example. You're considering wiring up some motorized electric battery traction. So you have two ELR devices, each requiring 24 volts with a peak current draw of one amp. If the two ELR devices are wired up in series, each device will only receive 12 volts, which is not sufficient since the hardware requires 24 volts. The two ELR devices must be wired up in parallel to make sure they both receive 24 volts. If, if both ELR devices are activated simultaneously, each device requires one amp at peak current draw. The power supply required for this would be a 24 volt power supply at two amps. So the hardware must be wired in parallel to ensure that both devices receive 24 volts and the two amp power supply is sufficient for the two ELR devices to be activated at one time. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Hopefully this made some sense to everybody. Thank you for staying around for this. I know it did run late. I'm gonna open this up to see if you have any questions. This I find to be a very fascinating subject. The more you learn about it, the more amazing it is, and the simpler it gets actually. It gets less and less complicated the more you understand it. And keep in mind, the worlds of AC and AC current and DC current are completely different. Thank you very much. Don't forget, Asabla Academy is offering classes almost every day at this time. And I really appreciate everyone attending. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.